America's comic book champions, swinging into action, grabbing our attention, luring new readers. Bob Brown takes you behind the scenes with those marvelous Marvel heroes when 2020 continues. 25 years ago, 1961. Now there's a notable year. John Kennedy became president. Alan Shepard became the first American in space. The bikini became fashionable. And Marvel Comics made its debut. Now, for the uninformed, or those of you who were reared on Flash Gordon or Archie or Superman, you may be surprised to learn that Marvel Comics is now the king of America's comic book publishers. They've done it despite a lot of heavy competition, and they've had to keep pace with changing tastes. How did they pull it off? Well, strap yourselves in. Bob Brown is going to tell us. of comic books, Marvel Comics. And this is Jim Shooter, who began writing for comic books when he was 13 years old and is now Marvel's editor-in-chief. Okay, we're going to be done today? Yeah. Good. Good. We're in the next hour. This thing is coming down to the wire. Comics started out as a schlock medium. Most of the guys who worked in comic books at the beginning changed their names so that they wouldn't become associated with comics. We have become legitimate as a medium. And most of the people who are here today in the industry came here because during the 60s as comics came into their own they got excited by it and they, they've grown up wanting to be in comics. You, you read the Marvel Age? Yeah, so where they three people die well, issue 210. With 100 million dollars in annual sales between seven and eight million issues each month Marvel now accounts for more than half the comic book market. But for the industry in general, total sales are only 15 to 20 percent of what they were in the best years, the 1940s, when Americans bought nearly one billion copies in a year. One source of Marvel's strength and continued growth has been its diversification. of the Pope and Nobel Peace Prize winner Mother Teresa doing issue-oriented material on drug abuse or child abuse, donating proceeds from their best-selling comic, The X-Men, to African famine relief, tapping the teen and adult market with issues like The New Mutants and slick publications called graphic novels. And there's more. Good, okay. Over on the other side of the country, Marvel is in TV and the movies. It's a trap! We've been set up! These people are recording the voices for what will eventually become an animated Saturday morning cartoon produced from Marvel's Hollywood offices. Get me down, fool! Get me down! Yeah, okay, but a little more angry. You'd be really angry. The company is currently churning out 250 half-hours of animated series as well as three feature-length cartoons, keeping a lot of executives occupied in weighty discussions. You need a normal-looking normal cuff. When they get the shrinky dust, they shrink and they grow the ears. Right. Production head Margaret Lesh is presiding over a casting session for the characters perched cutely at the other end of the table, the shrinky dinks. 
We don't know yet whether the Shrinky Dinks will make it into the Marvel stable of characters. More importantly, it's time now to introduce you to one more character at this meeting. The man in the sunglasses. A creative supervisor without whom everything we've just shown you and the history of comic books in general would be a far, far different story. His name is Stan Lee, and before he helped revolutionize the comic book industry 25 years ago, he had labored for 20 years before that as a writer and editor at Timely Comics, the predecessor of Marvel. These are the types of comics Stan Lee was writing in those early years, from romances to westerns, keeping teams of artists busy drawing the books at the prodigious rate of two per week. Was there ever a time early in your career then when you'd go to a cocktail party and somebody would ask you, well, what do you do? And you'd have to say, oh, I write comic books or... Uh, yes, did it. really, yes. very often in the early days, uh, before Marvel. Uh, I'd be at a party with my wife and somebody would come over and just as you say, what do you do? And I'd get a little bit nervous and I'd say, well, I, I'm a writer. And they'd say, oh, really? What do you write? Well, I still had a couple of options. I'd say, uh, I write magazine stories. And I'd start to walk away, but what magazines? Well, I still had a chance and I would say, well, children's magazines. Which ones? At some point I was pinned down and it had to be comic books. And then, oh, I see, and they drift away. To make things worse, the General Motors of the comic industry at that time was a rival company, DC Comics, which had a corner on the superhero market with Superman and Batman. Then, in 1960, Stan Lee was asked to create a superhero team for his company, which would publish the story as the first Marvel comic. His idea of what superheroes should be embodied in a group called the Fantastic Four, would redefine the form. Before the Marvel superheroes, um, the superheroes you read about really never had to worry about making a living. Women always were in love with them. They didn't have to worry about getting dates. They were always pushing the girls away. Uh, they didn't have to worry about acne or dandruff or fallen arches or anything like that. So in the Fantastic Four, Two of the main characters constantly bickered at each other. And Stan Lee went on to create Spider-Man, a superhero who was also worried about how to get a high-paying job. Now, if you can do the same thing in front of the lights and cameras, you're having mad. The Incredible Hulk, a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde hero. The Silver Surfer, who frequently agonized, uncertainly, over the state of humankind. And others like Thor, God of Thunder, and Doctor Strange. Arthur Berger, who teaches a course in pop culture at San Francisco State University, says that Marvel roster of heroes added a new dimension to the problems of how to cope if you have superpowers. When Stan Lee started writing, we started getting neurotic characters, we started getting uh, characters who were ambivalent about certain things, uh, characters who had psychological problems, we started getting social problems being uh, put into the comic strip and so forth. So you got a much more uh, interesting and um, well-developed type of characterization. I think that's a big innovation that he made. But how did that approach stack up against the tried and true DC comic heroes like Superman and Batman? Well, this team of reviewers gives Marvel the thumbs up. Marvel is more like realistic. DC sort of, you know, they have invincible superheroes who never die, they're always there, and they have like one death where Marvel sort of shocks the world, where people die and everything, like they have all, it's more like real. It's real. You can, it's you more can believable. Feel the emotions of the characters, yeah. like you can better. You and like care about them. DC is kind of like cliche. For sure. Of, like, the villains. They all have their cape and everything. This looks like a job for Superman. Superman. And cliche. And if you look at Stan Lee's work, for example, or many other works, you find that there's some pretty interesting stuff going on in terms of ethic, morality, sense of obligation to society, that kind of stuff. Here's an example of what it's all about from the very first Spider-Man story retold in this television cartoon. The first time we meet Spider-Man, whose civilian identity is 
Peter Parker. He's more interested in showing off his superpowers on national television than he is in fighting crime. My first stop will be the nearest TV studio. I've just got to be the answer to Ed Sullivan's prayers. There's a situation in which the Spider-Man could have prevented a criminal from escaping from the police. self-centered and involved in himself that he didn't bother. What's with you, mister? All you had to do was trip him or hold him just for a minute. That's your problem, not mine. That criminal then killed his uncle. The fugitive who ran past me the other day. The one I didn't stop when I had the chance. He'd come up with a very powerful statement about the necessity of people to be involved in society and not just to sort of uh, just look, look at themselves and be egocentric. If I only had tackled him when I had the chance. But I didn't, so he escaped, and now Uncle Ben is dead, and in a sense, it's really I who killed him. Because I didn't realize in time that with great power, there must also always be great responsibility. And there are other lessons that Marvel Comics have managed to add into the story. Um, vocabulary. I find it has more vocabulary in comics than other books. If we wanted to say somebody was misanthropic, um, or if a, if a situation was cataclysmic, or whatever the word was, we'd use it. And if a kid had to go to a dictionary and look it up, that's not the worst thing in the world that could happen. I love the sound of certain phrases and words, and I would make up things like, by the hoary hosts of Hoggoth, let it be, and things of that sort. By the shades of the shadowy seraphim and the crimson rings of Ratarok. And anyway, um, I remember one kid said, I'm doing a term paper on the incantations of Dr. Strange, and I'm um, comparing his incantations to the ancient writings of so-and-so, and... -so, and when did you first read those ancient writings? And I didn't know what he was talking about. I had never even heard of them. But I learned one lesson. If you try to make it seem credible and believable, it is almost impossible to write anything that people won't read much more into than you yourself uh, ever intended. Thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Stan Lee has certainly become one thing he never intended to be, a folk hero to comic book fans everywhere. And his influence has spread even to rival DC Comics, which has announced it is changing Superman's character somewhat to make him more contemporary, more human. Some comic book fans have referred to the changes as marvelizing Superman. Since moving to work at Marvel's production center in California, Lee has acquired a home with a pool, a pair of sunglasses we never saw him take off, and a position as an elder statesman with the folks back at the Marvel offices in New York, Stan still contributes to special issues. And then another thing you might jot down, Jim. On page 13, he had his helmet on, and he's fighting the Hulk. And then on page 14, he's fighting the Hulk without his helmet, but we didn't see the helmet being knocked off. It might be a good idea. He can also he acknowledge in the midst of this success that for his entire professional life, he has used a ploy that many of his superheroes used, hiding behind another identity. My name was originally Stanley Martin Lieber, which you know, had a ring to it, and it sounded like a real name. When I was doing comics, I wanted to save my real name for that great American novel, which I haven't written yet, and I just took my first name and cut it in half, and I figured that sounds good for comic book writer, Stan Lee. It's a silly name, you know, it's like Martin or Irv Ing, but I'm stuck with it. I'm glad my name is an Engelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> <laughs> they have come a long way, uh, Bob, since the days of a brick bouncing off somebody's head and the word bonk written out. And uh, they tried to be comical originally. There weren't adventure strips originally. No, the first uh, comic books were, were based on the comic strips that were syndicated in the newspapers. They were essentially reprints of those uh, strips that were handed out as premiums or, or giveaways. They became so popular that they realized they could sell them. And after they ran out of syndicated uh, characters to meet the demand, then they began inventing their own characters for the comic books. And that's how Superman and Batman and all the rest came about.
Fascinating. Thank you, Bob. Well, 2020 will continue in a moment. Uh, 